Luke 19, verse 1 to 13. Then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but could not because of the crowd, for he was of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, Make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, so crazy, they all complained, saying he has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. You have to know how to silence the day that want to make you feel less than the call of God on your life. Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and back then and like today, nobody likes tax collectors. Today we call them IRS. Back then, they were called by name, <laughs> right? So the people didn't like the man. But Jesus saw beyond what they saw. They saw from the surface, Jesus saw what he formed. Zacchaeus was after Jesus. So he didn't, he ignored that, right? And that what I love about Zacchaeus too, he didn't respond. You don't see a response from Zacchaeus saying, hey, shut up, I'm gonna charge you some more taxes. All the pettiness was out of his system. You have to know there's some things that are not worth you responding. Because you have the audience of the one that matters. You don't need to go back and forth, tit tat, none of that. Let God show up and, and, and let the fruit of your life respond. All right. Then it says, then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. Zacchaeus is not trying to prove to God that my works are worthy. He has come to a place, you see, when it says he received Jesus joyfully, he has come to a place where he's like, I know better. Money no longer has me. Because prior to Zacchaeus, there was another rich man in Luke 18 that was trying to find Jesus, came to him, and was talking about the things that Jesus is like, but you still got some bondage. He's like, look, Lord, I do this, I do that. I follow these commandments. And then Jesus says, all right, all right, that's good. Now sell everything you've got. Give to the poor. He could not handle that one. But here's the crazy thing. It says he, 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 it grieved him. He walked away from the instruction, but he was bitter. He was grieved. He knew that the decision he made was not the right one. But he did not know. He, he was wrestling with holding on to what kept him in bondage. Or can I take the risk of following Jesus? But he didn't even pay attention to how he was feeling. The thing that should keep him happy, like, oh, no, I'm not selling. If, if choosing you means I have to sell all my things, I'm keeping my things. But why are you grieved? Because you know the truth. And you know that this is love. Jesus is not trying to take from you. But he, that thing already has you. It has a stronghold on your life. So Jesus is after the bondage, not the thing. So... When Zacchaeus comes to Jesus one chapter later, and he says, I sell, what, what was it, half of his things? If Jesus really cared about the money, he would be like, Zacchaeus, sell everything. Actually, there's still 50%. Sell that too. But Jesus looked at a man who was not in bondage, who was not a slave to money. He was not a slave to things anymore. So Jesus responds and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house because he 
Zacchaeus is also the son of Abraham. For the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Oh, it's so beautiful. Now, as they heard these things, who were the day? The disciples, right? He spoke another parable because he was near Jerusalem and because they thought the kingdom of God would appear immediately. There were many disciples that followed Jesus for the wrong reasons. Because they thought he was here to establish his kingdom immediately. And Jesus is about to bring them into a parable to say, hey, no, you got a part to play. This, this is not just about the kingdom appearing immediately. So let me explain this to you in a parable. First of all, you just watch this man who everyone has called a sinner. He's not liked in, the, in society and all of that. And you have watched him come into salvation. So I want to show you something. Let, let, me, let me share this parable with you. And so he says, Therefore he said, a certain nobleman, went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So he called 10 of his servants, delivered to them 10 minas and said to them, do business till I come. Now you may be seated. I'm going to give you some context. We have been in a series called God and business it just happened organically. Right, started two weeks ago with our pastor. Can we acknowledge our pastors in the house? <laughs> acknowledge our senior pastors, Pastor Teray Roberts, Pastor Sarah Jakes Roberts. So we started this series, and in this text, the parts I did not read is when it says that he called 10 of his servants and gave them 10 minas, he gave each of them individually one mina. Right? And it's interesting because they had different results. Someone had took one mina and turned it into 10 minas. Mina is currency. It's a, it was about three months of wages, I believe, at the time. It's a currency. So one person took one mina, turned it into 10 minas. Another took one mina, turned it into five. Another took one mina, turned it into one. And then there were some just didn't do nothing about the meanness, right? Naturally, another took, the second person, I believe, took five and turned it, no, took one, turned it into five. The third person had one and came to the master and said, you know what, I feared you. And so I did nothing with it. I put it in a handkerchief. And there's another seven that we don't even hear about what they did with their meanness. Right, so maybe they had some ignorance issues right there. But then the third one is interesting because he said, I feared you. So I did nothing with it. Put it in a handkerchief. It's interesting because that's how we relate to God sometimes. There is a difference. This kind of fear is when you are afraid, not the fear of the Lord. When you have this concept of being afraid of God, then you are, you, you're, when it comes to, you're not motivated to really be who he's called you to be. Because it's just like, man, you're more driven by, ah, I don't really want to disobey you, but like, I'm not really trying to change either, so I'm just stuck. Because I'm afraid of you. And in being afraid, what does that cause? It causes you to hide. Starting in the Garden of Eden. The first thing they did when they, were, they knew they were naked and afraid, they hid. Shame is always connected to that type of fear. And so how can you be open to being used by God when you're also hiding? So it's interesting that he put the mina, he hid the mina in a handkerchief. Because could that also represent how he's covering himself? Because he has this perspective, this, this flawed perspective of God that I feared you so I did nothing. Like I said earlier, love is the greatest motivator for change. Love is the greatest motivator to be who God called you to be. If you live from this place of rules and regulations, according to the law, you would always break it. Because there is no relationship there. It's just checklists. Okay, my boss told me to do this. All right. 
but there's no relationship. So if I miss it, ah, you know, his love is, he, he loves me still. But when it's relationship, it's like, man, I, I don't want to hurt this person. I don't want to disappoint this person. We walk together. And I recognize how much you love me. So, so Lord, help me. Help, let, let's figure this out together. But I don't want to jump into that area yet, right? So let me go back to the series. So in the series, we started talking about how there is there's an emphasis on how God uses business to bring forth his kingdom, right? And God's people had a misunderstanding of the kingdom. They thought, like I said, that they will, it would just appear. And then God is correcting them to show them that, no, no, you have a, you have a part to play. You have a hand in this. Right? And then he tells them there is, you know, because when they bring meanness to him, so when the servants, you got to read the whole thing, it will bless you. But when the servants bring back a return on what he gave them, instead of him saying, oh, great, now here's more meanness, he responds and tells them, now take territory, rule over 10 cities for the one who brought 10 meanness. Now rule over 10 cities. So according to the amount they brought, he gave them territory that they will now become leaders and rulers in those spaces now it's interesting because the word for for do business can translate to the word occupy so the lord is literally telling them look he's speaking about himself jesus was getting ready to be crucified he was getting ready to be crucified on the cross and resurrect and all of that and by doing that he gets the kingdom but then, for that kingdom to be established, it wouldn't just appear, it must be expanded from the spiritual realm to the natural realm. And the difference in its expansion is that they would do it by operating through the Holy Spirit. That they would do it, that there is something that the Lord would give to them that would cause them to be powerful in those spaces. You see, as we were talking and, and we were, and, and you're coming into this awareness that there is more to you than you know about yourself. And if you partner with what the Holy Spirit says about you, and you partner with him, and you walk with him, it will change your life. You see, I, I began to think about what the meanness represented. Because they all had the same thing, but different results. They all had the same advantage, but different results. But when you put it in the context of Jesus speaking to his disciples, he's giving them a parable for them to also see themselves in. What would be the thing that Jesus would give his disciples that it would be the same across the board? Because this is different. There's another parable in Matthew 25 when Jesus is called the parable of the talents. And Jesus is saying, you know, there's one, the master gives one five talents, another two talents, another one, each according to his capacity, right, or his ability. But this was not about, ooh, child. <laughs> this was not about their ability. All of them had equal playing field. They all had one mina, but different results. What did the mina represent? And as I was praying with the Lord about this, it represented the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit that operated through Jesus is the same Holy Spirit that is in you. Is the same Holy Spirit that is in me. Is the same Holy Spirit that is in some of the generals of the faith. It's the same Holy Spirit. And I was going to wait till I asked you this, but before we go into some of the things I'm going to teach on, the question that the Lord had pressed so heavy on my heart is what are you doing with the Holy Spirit? Each and every one of you as believers, you have something. You have God in you. One of my favorite songs, and it, it's not even like, they, they were just worshiping and it just flowed out. And the line says, Holy Ghost, 
you and I can change the world. If I fully surrender to you, Holy Spirit, we can change the world. And you see, how do we do that? There are certain spheres of influence that God sends you into. That with the help of the Holy Spirit, you will manifest his kingdom there. Not, not just in your own agenda, but the Holy Spirit begins to teach you. And begins to give you insight and wisdom on what you must do to bring forth the kingdom. That's why when Jesus was teaching the disciples how to pray, one of the key things he said is your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How is it revealed? Through the Holy Spirit. The will of God for that industry revealed through the Holy Spirit and the part that you play in it. And so I want to go through a few things because I don't know how many of you have ever heard about the mountains of influence. Show of hands. Okay, beautiful, I'll, I'll speak on that. So the mountains of influence, it basically speaks to that in every society, there are certain areas that impact and influence the people. And so it was, they coined this term, the seven mountains of influence, but there's much more to it. Because I could even add one of the things that I might not share in this message is like science and technology, right? But let me go through a few things to show you how God has need of you in these spaces. That it's not just a job or a passion or a career, but it's actually the Lord sending you in these spaces because he has need of you to manifest his kingdom there. So with the seven mountains of influence, the first one, the government mountain. This speaks of politics, parliament, and authority. The Bible says in Proverbs 29, 2, when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice. But when a wicked man rules, the people groan. Now it's interesting, you know, because um, any Africans in the building? All right, all right. I'm Nigerian, so the continent of Africa. <laughs> Afrobeat, right, Africa is not a country. It's a continent. <laughs> now, Afrobeat has really elevated how people perceive Africa, right? Because now there is the hunger to go and experience the culture, and people are exposed to the fact that, wait, there's luxury in Africa. Right? There's beauty in Africa. There's, there's all kinds of things in Africa, but unfortunately, it doesn't take away the fact that there is still great poverty in Africa. And this always baffles me because I'm going to share some things with you. That how can a continent be experiencing such great poverty when, check this, it holds 40% of the world's gold. The largest reserves of diamonds, platinum, and uranium are in Africa. It holds 65% of world's farmable land and 10% of the planet's internal renewable fresh water source. And you know what the truth is? That Africa is not poor. Corrupt leaders are the source of its instability. <laughs> Leadership. Right now, we are celebrating Black History Month, right? And it's a beautiful thing. Now we got, you know, we got our white brothers and sisters that some might be wondering, like, why y'all got this month every year? <laughs> the black people don't find that funny. <laughs> I'm just sharing the thoughts of others, not my thought. <laughs> but I want to speak to this, right? Because it's a month where we get to celebrate the achievements, past and present, of African Americans. And why is this so important? Because you, it's a reminder to America that there was a time where the black man, the black woman, did not have the freedom to have an achievement. And do you know why? Because slavery, racial segregation, were all protected by the law government. The law protected it. 
They didn't have the freedom to be who God called them to be. You see, the one who is a leader of a nation shapes the destiny of the nation. And so you have people who are born in that nation with a great call of God on their lives, but it is oppressed through government, oppressed through leadership. Biblically, there was a woman named Esther in the Bible who became the queen of Egypt, right? And there was a time where, you know, there was a, there was a man called Haman, and Esther's cousin, Mordecai, had done something he didn't like. And so in order for him to, you know, do payback, but really he was influenced by the enemy because we will see throughout, you know, biblical history, different times where the enemy tried to annihilate the Jews, right? Because he feared what was going to come from them. So then, Haman is like, you know what, I'm gonna get this guy back. And you know what he tried to do? Not even what he tried to do, what he did do. He goes to the king, the king not realizing how this would even impact his wife. He gets the king's ring to have a decree that by the law, on a certain day, all the Jews should be killed. Basically, like they should wipe them out. When Esther finds out, she goes into fasting. That was her response. And what I love about this is because biblically, the word of God calls you kings and priests. It says that the Lord has called you to rule, but you would rule through priesthood. And priesthood is the understanding that you are in service to God in everything that you do. So you cannot be in service to God and not be disciplined in the things of God. So even when calamity rises, there's a different response you have. You seek the one whose service you are in. So calamity rises, Esther responds by fasting. Lord, we need you to intervene in this matter. After fasting, she gains favor. The king is willing to do anything for her. But even in his love for her, you know what he could not do? Change the law. So Esther had to use her position, recognizing you're not just queen to have a better living experience. You're queen because God has need of a priest in the palace. So Esther now uses her position to create a new law that says the Jews can fight back. And that's what saved them, the law. Oh, thank you, Jesus. God wants to do something here. But we're going to flow and we're going to let him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Actually, right now, I just need, I need to release a word. For anyone who is in politics, um, and, and what I mean, politics, parliament, you are part of, you are in the rooms where the laws are being made. You are in the rooms where laws are being executed. You're in the rooms where laws are being interpreted. Um, can you stand to your feet right now? I need, a, I, need a, I need to release a prayer. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There are five people the Lord was showing me. And, and this includes, I'm talking about you're in the police department. You are, and that's what I mean when the laws are execu executed, you're being sent out. When something happens, you are part of the people that are doing the arresting. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Can you just... Stretch your hands to these ones. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Heavenly Father, there are some that you're trying to locate right now. I don't know out of them which one it was trying to quit their job. Thank you, Lord. But you are revealing that you are not in that position by accident. God has need of you there. It's not just your job, it's your assignment. It may not feel glamorous, it might not feel like the thing you're seeing on your social media feed, but it's because God has need of a priest in those spaces. That you will begin to pray and your prayers will change the outcome. Thank you, Jesus. Do not quit. And if I'm speaking directly to that person, just raise your hand. You are about to quit your job. 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can we just praise God in this house? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, let's continue. I'm trying to find the rhythm between what's happening and what we're going to continue. We're going to let it flow. You're not in your place of work by accident. It's more than a check. It's where you were sent. You see, let's go to the Media Mountain. This is the place of the power of storytelling. Do you know, I mean, first of all, depending on, on where, you, where you are politically, right, there are certain news stations you might watch. Because it's catered to support an agenda. It's not catered to inform you of truth. So the media is the place where stories are told, but the stories that are being told, many of them lack integrity. And as long as they can keep you ignorant, then injustice continues. As long as they can keep you ignorant, they can keep you separated. They can keep you at war with each other when there is a divine purpose for your unity. So now we see each other through the lens of the stories we're told. That is why God has need for people who without compromise will tell the truth. You see, when I was growing up, and I could correlate this to family members who were in America, and then myself who was in Nigeria, the media would paint a terrible picture of African Americans, while in America, the media painted a terrible picture of Africans. For Africans that went to high school years ago, there was a name that they called. Many people, some people know the name. Okay, it ended with scratchers. You could research it. I don't want to say the first part. While in, in Africa, they painted a picture where it just looked like, oh, it's a, it's a love, just gangs. Now, can you imagine, do you know why this is harmful? Because what if in the, in, in the, in the perfect will of God, there was business that both sides should have been doing together all that time. But because of the stories that were told, there was division where they didn't have to be. Do you realize when you go through history that America had, <laughs> they had this, um, it was a common thing that would be done where in order to, when they want to criminalize a certain race, they first paint you in the media to look crazy. <laughs> they, they will paint that race to look a certain way so they can criminalize things that should not even be, people should not go to jail for. But they use the media to send, a, uh, uh, to, to send a message that will cause you to be at war with someone you should love. And none of it was rooted in truth. It was rooted in their agenda. Media. God has need for people in media. Arts and entertainment, this is the mountain that influences culture and behavior. Now, Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. What influences how you think shapes who you become. And this is the power of arts and entertainment. The Bible talks about how we should be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That word renewing means renovation. But unfortunately, sometimes the wrong message is renovating how we think. Art and entertainment influences how your views on sex, marriage, your, your life, what you buy, your spending habits. There are people that would go broke trying to look like something they can't afford. Why is this important? Because if, you ha if your mind is being renewed by what matters, then maybe the finances you're looking to start the business is hidden in the life you're trying to fake. But you're influenced by what you see, what you hear. So art and entertainment, they have your eyes and they have your ears. That's right. 
That's why it's Super Bowl Sunday, right? Last year, Super Bowl had over 100 million views. That's why ads will spend so much money just to get your eyes for 30 seconds. 30 seconds, millions of dollars. If they place that much value on getting information to you, shouldn't you place value on what you give yourself to receive? It shapes you. So God has need for people. Their fame is not evil. Even Jesus, it was said of him that his fame spread throughout the land. Fame can be utilized in the hands of God. Matter of fact, it is designed to be utilized in the hands of God. There are people that you're calling necessitates you to have fame. Because through that, what, how you live your life would influence a generation about the image of Christ. Arts and entertainment, right? I love it. Even um, I was, uh, a friend of mine is involved in this and how Amazon recently partnered with The Wonder Project to produce faith-based films. That's huge. It was a huge success. Because now the industry is realizing that there's a faith-based community that has been underserved. You're feeding us things that we, we, we are looking for something that will speak to our faith. So now they're making space. They're making space. But as they're making space, rise up. Don't conform. Rise up. Then we have the religion mountain. I love it in Joshua 24, verse 15, he talks about choose this day whom you will serve. There is a pastor who I admire so much. His name goes by Apostle Joshua Salmon. And there was something he said about the religion mountain, which I love. He said, it decides the spiritual convictions of the people within a territory. You see, this is church. It's not just so that we can come on La Brea, have a good time, go home. Then on Sunset Boulevard, you got psychics also having their meetings. Then, you know, a few blocks after that, you have a, a satanic temple also having their meetings. Everybody just having meetings, having a good time and going home. No, it's about territory. That when the Lord plants a church in a region, he is after the influence of that territory to have the spiritual convictions that aligns them with the will of God. It's not just for this little cute corner. It is so that his people can gather, be equipped in understanding their kingdom mandate in God so that when you're sent out, you're sent out with a mentality of taking territory. It, the, the church doesn't start and end in these walls. You are the church. It's beautiful when Jesus, there, there's a scripture that has often been misunderstood um, by certain, you know, um, interpretations or whatnot. But when Jesus had that moment with Peter, when Jesus was like, who do men say that I am? And then he says, Peter, who do you say that I am? And then Peter now says, you are the Christ. The son of God. And then Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And then he says, and you are Peter. And upon this rock, I shall build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail. Now people confuse it to think Jesus was trying to build on Peter. But when we look at the Greek translation of that text, Peter is called Petros. And the rock is Petra. Petros is stone. Petra is rock. Right? Now, Petros comes from Petra. It comes out of Petra. So Jesus is saying, he is the rock. And upon the revelation of Christ, those he sends out... As he sends you out, as he sends Peter, as he sends the disciples, wherever he sends you, because you are moving in the revelation that wait, Christ is God. Yeah. 
And, and, and there is a kingdom that he is after. And he is sending. I'm not, I'm not random. We had, there was a message. You got to watch it if you haven't. It's called a sent one. It says, I didn't start here. I was sent here. So when the Lord sends you, that he's sending you with something that you can take territory. And the gates of hell will not prevail. What is he saying? Even when opposition comes against you, they will not have the victory. Peter. If you understand that your power is because I sent you. Your power is not going to be in you. That's why the Bible, there's a scripture that calls us living stones. The stone that comes out of the rock. When you know that God is the one who sent you into media. God sent you into arts and entertainment. He says, even though people might oppose your way of doing things, when you have the mentality that you came from God, you can't be stopped. The problem is that we don't move with a territory mindset. We live with a me mindset. We are not moving with the understanding that this is about territory. That God is sending you into spaces so that you can manifest his kingdom on the earth. Yeah. Right? And then we have the family mountain. Family is important to God. Jesus was traced to a family. But families are under attack. And one of the reasons they're under attack is for the children. In Malachi 2.15 it says this. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit, and why one? He seeks godly offspring. Not just any offspring, a godly offspring. Because you see, family is the backbone of a community. And the Lord is looking for the, the family units that would raise their children up in the ways of God. And one of the reasons it redeems the child time. When a child is raised up to know the ways of God, they live with a different type of precision. They, can, they start to hear the voice of God and know the voice of God and they can identify the voices of the enemy. They can be led by the spirit of God quicker. So if the Lord has an assignment in the, in, 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 for, for the generation and he's sending children, how does the Lord send answers? Through family. You are an answer for your generation. And so the Lord is like, I need to send an answer, but I'm, I can't find a family that will fit. I, I'm looking. The eyes of the Lord are searching the earth. Do you know there are some answers that are being held back? Because the Lord is looking for the right family unit that he can, boom, send it into. And then when he can't, he has to start drawing other people to be an influence into the child's life. Family matters to God. Check this out about Abraham, right? Why was it that the Lord was so drawn to Abraham that he could entrust Abraham's lineage with Christ? Genesis 18, 19 says this, For I have known him. In order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of the Lord to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken of him. Can you imagine this? There was something spoken of Abraham. But in order for the Lord to bring it, Abraham had to embrace a posture that he will command his children in the ways of the Lord. So there was, a, there was something destined to Abraham's lineage. But in order for the Lord to bring it to fulfillment, it says, no, no. Abraham became the person that will command his children in the ways of the Lord. There are things that God wants to send to you. But will you handle it according to the way that it would not be abused when you receive it? Right? Family matters to God. If the society fails, if the family fails rather, the society fails. When the enemy wants to attack the society, he attacks the families. Then there's the education mountain. 
which is also important because it is also, it, it, it has it's an, a huge influence on children again. If you start doing studies and research, you would realize that there's many who, are, who, who have come to this understanding that public schools are sexualizing children. There are things they're teaching kids they have no business knowing about. And so the earliest way to indoctrinate a child in ways that is against the word of the Lord is education. Education. That's why God needs people in education. People that will stand on something in education. There was a testimony I recently heard, and this has been confirmed. It was a teacher... And this teacher, she recognized that her position was not just to be a teacher for a check or to be a teacher so it could be added to her resume. She recognized that it was an assignment by God. And so she came into covenant with God that, Lord, I will stay in this place. But here is our covenant. Every student that you have put under my care, nothing would harm them. So she goes to class one day, and she doesn't see one of her students. She, re she, she creates a personal relationship with your parents. She calls the parents to say, hey, I didn't see your child. And there was something tragic that happened the day before that the child passed away. But they were still at the hospital. So she says, can I come visit? Because this happened in like, you know, the late hours of the night. The teacher goes, and she said, God, we have a covenant. As long as I'm here, nothing can happen to these children. The teacher, the, so she's like arguing with the doctor. The, she's like, you know what, doctors, when you're doing your business, nobody's bothering you. Now I'm about to do surgery. Can you please leave the room? The, the, the child's parent says, you know what, doctors, please just, you know, leave. She prays over that child. And the child came back to life. She, she saw it differently. She said, no, 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 that, that, I'm not trying to send condolences, right? She said, no, God, we have a covenant. I'm in this position not to mourn the ones you have given me. She had a different mentality about her, her, about her position as a teacher. She saw herself as a covering. She saw herself as a priest in the school. And God honored it and send the spirit of the child back into the body. Education. Now we are in a series about business and there is the business and finance mountain. And here is why there is such an emphasis on business. Because every other mountain is influenced by business and finance. For the integrity of the agenda of God to advance, God's people need to be in business and finance. You see, even Jesus, there was something that happened. Let me share this with you. In Matthew 17, 27, there was this whole conversation about paying taxes, right? And, you know, about are they exempt, this, this, and that. But check out what it says. It says, however, we don't want to offend them because technically Jesus didn't have to pay taxes. He's Jesus. <laughs> he says, however... We don't want to offend them, so go down to the lake. He's speaking that it's important. When you study the Bible, you always want to pay attention to who is he speaking to, what is the context of that, and why. Because if you're just reading this as, so go down to the lake and throw in a line, open the mouth of the first fish you catch, and you will find a large, large silver coin, take it and pay the tax for both of us, you would only look at the supernatural. You will be like, wow. Jesus just said, hey, just throw a line in the sea, right? Pick up a fish, fish has money, pay our taxes. But when you look at who did he instruct to do this? Peter, a fisherman. There are many ways that God, I mean, you know, in the form of, in flesh, Jesus, would have manifested the miracle. But when it came to the language of finances, he speaks to Peter that through Peter's business skill, the supernatural would happen. 
He says, Peter, you're a fisherman. Now go get one of those fishing rods. He had a whole fishing business. And the fact that Peter so quickly had a rod, he might still have been in business, right? <laughs> so he's like, Peter, get that. Throw a line, pick one fish. We don't need a net. Peter was used to fishing with nets because they would catch many. You see, when the Lord begins to change your strategy, humble yourself to recognize it was never about the things that you did. It was about the supernatural back in your life. So the Lord is not asking Peter, get a net, grab a lot of fishes, sell them. He says, we, we got things to do. There's a quicker way to go about this. And so in his divine wisdom and with the supernatural backing him up, he says, you know what? We're going to call, there's going to be a fish, swallow the, uh, a coin. Now we're going to cause that fish to be attracted. It will be the first one attracted to your hook. Supernatural. But the means that the supernatural took place was through the construct of business. It was a business skill that opened the door for supernatural provision. Why I'm sharing this is that you are, don't think of the idea as ever too small to start. Because when the Holy Spirit reveals something, when he begins to tell you, now I want you to strike here. I want you to do this because you have need for the finances for what I want you to do in the other mountains. Yes. Yeah. There are things, there are places I'm calling you to and I don't need you to lose your integrity because you're after a check from that mountain. So the Lord, I'm telling you this, that we are in a time that the Holy Spirit wants to make sure that every believer is established financially so you don't compromise where he's sending you. There are things God has need of. I'll share a testimony. Um, before I, I got into ministry, I was in real estate. I was flipping properties. The Lord calls me out of that and calls me into ministry. A couple weeks ago, the Lord, the Holy Spirit tells me, you know what, there's things I have need for you to do. And in order for you to do this, I need you to, there's going to be a property I'm going to send you away. This is literally like my prayers, oftentimes prayers for me is like strategy rooms. It's me talking to the Lord about what was the plan. He starts telling me about something he wants me to do that is going to be financially tasking. He says, but I'm going to open up a door again in real estate. Look at how you can partner with the Holy Spirit. I said, I'm like, Lord, I have not done a property in how many years? And so he says, no, I'm going to give you favor with it. So I talked to my husband. I'm like, you know, babe, this is what I received from the Lord. I'm like, what, pray about it and let me know if you're in agreement and then we can move forward. Because even in a marriage, what the Lord tells me is still submitted to my husband. And I have to trust that he, if he really wants me, see, God is about order. Don't believe the hype that there is something the Lord will want you to do and then your husband is against it, now your husband is your enemy. No, if the Lord is for it, he knows how to talk to the person who is your covering. Culture has us messed up. But I, I brought it to my husband. I said, babe, you know, you let me know. He prayed about it. He's like, no, let's strike. The Lord confirms it. Let's strike. So then I called my brother who, you know, he's, also, he's in real estate. I'm like, hey, we want to do a property. Can you get me something good? He tells me about this particular property. He said, it's a gem. What they're selling it for is a steal. It doesn't even make sense how much they're selling it for. But if you flip this property, if you renovate it, what we could get out of it would be so much greater. And I'm like, he's like, but there's, there's competition. It's a lot of eyes on this one. I said, that's the one we want. Because as he was talking, the Holy Spirit again confirms that's the property. So I said, no, that's the one. So I told, I'm like, I told my husband, I'm like, let's get ready. This, this is going to be the one, right? So my brother, you know, he puts the bid in. He's like, let's see, let's see. And there are other ones he's trying to get. It wasn't, that was not the only one he got. He has his own, you know, investors and clients and himself and all of that stuff, right? But with this one, we're like, okay, this is the one we want. He puts the bid in. Out of all the properties he puts bids for, that was the only one he got. So he calls me. He said, oh, we got it. I said, oh, I knew. 
I knew we were going to get it. That's not a surprise. <laughs> because I'm not the one after it. This was revealed to me in a strategy session. And so when, when we got the property, so we're about to open escrow really soon. And I'm like, okay, Holy Spirit, now what is the plan? Are you tracking with me? The Lord, you don't count, don't, don't label yourself. If you put labels and titles on yourself, you box in what God wants to do with you. When I walked away from real estate, it's because at that time, it had me. And God was calling me into ministry. So he says, walk away from all this. This, the, 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 you know, the finances you're making, it has a stronghold on you. Walk away from it. Led me into ministry. When that is no longer a stronghold on my life, he said, we have work to do. But for this thing, you need finances. So here is the door I'm going to open so you can do what I'm telling you to do. There is strategy in God. This is what the Bible calls the manifestations, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, wisdom, knowledge. There are things God wants to reveal to you that you don't need to strike, you know, amiss. You can strike with precision. And you can be confident because you're like, I, it's not coming from me. It is a revelation that came from the Lord. The Lord has need for you in business and finance. There are some of you, you've been, the Lord has been talking to you about the podcast, podcast, podcast. You're like, I don't want to be another podcaster. Do you know the money in podcasts right now? How much they're giving people for the deals? And you have no clue that maybe your podcast is not about, it's not just about your podcast, but there is something that the Lord would do so that he can bring finances your way so that in another mountain you're called to influence, you don't compromise. And that's for someone in the room, actually. You've been running from the instruction God gave you because you're like, I don't want to be another one. And the Lord is like, if you would use the skill, if you would use the story, if you would use the thing I gave you, the supernatural will flow through it. But I need to use something. The Bible says he would establish the works of your hands. If there is no works, what is he establishing? So there are things that the Lord is trying to get to you, but through a means. When Jesus needed to pay his taxes, it happened through Peter fishing. Business and finance, right? So now let's get back to the scripture and the meanness and the Holy Spirit. When you walk with the Holy Spirit, it will change your life. But here is the thing. You cannot see the Holy Spirit as a force, as wind, as a feeling. He is a person of the Godhead, and he lives in you. He, he is a person. So many times, I know I've been guilty of this. When you're fasting, maybe you're doing a seven-day fast, right? And on day two, you broke the fast. And when you broke it, you said, well, we here now. <laughs> Might as well just go all the way and restart tomorrow. And then you just start, you know, you just break the fast. <laughs> all the way. But you know why we do that? Because we see the Holy Spirit as a force, a wind. We are more concerned about, ah, okay, God, I already disobeyed, so whew, might as well go all the way, right? We even live like that. When, when we're wilding out, we're doing things we're not supposed to, we're like, well, God, I'm here now. I'm already at the club. I might as well have a few drinks, <laughs> right? I might as well share the love. We here now. <laughs> I'm sharing my story. <laughs> I remember it was like, you know, years, 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 years ago. <laughs> years ago. <laughs> Heading to the club with some friends, and the Holy Spirit tells me, I don't want you to go. I said, well, I already got dressed up. <laughs> we already have the playlist. <laughs> we are going. <laughs> 
And I, I'm literally telling you what I said back. I said, I know you all see him, but just shut your eyes on this one. That's how we see it. Like, God, the moment I'm disobeying, you know, I'm already in shame. So just, just, just don't look today. Look at me tomorrow. So then we go, and I'm like, child, we here now. There's some of the people that we used to party with that go to this church. I'm sure they're like, wow, look at what the Lord can do. <laughs> right? <laughs> It's because we look at it more as, ah, if I'm disobeying, let me go all the way. If you see him as a person, if you hurt your friend, would you just say, well, we already started off on bad terms. So let me just hurt you some more throughout the day. And then tomorrow, let's reset. Would you do that to your friend? If your friend is grieved about something, would you just be like, I'm ignoring you right now because I'm on a road. That is the difference with repentance. Repentance is not scheduled. That's where we've missed it. We schedule repentance. We're like, God, I, I'm already here. So tomorrow is a new day. I'm going to restart. Oh, committing my, you wake up early, worship God. I'm committing my life. <laughs> if your repentance has a schedule, it's not repentance. It's convenience. Because the nature of repentance is that you identify that you have grieved your friend. You're like, no, right now, God right now right now i'm walking away from this right now if it's on schedule it's not repentance and the holy spirit wants to walk with you he wants to do life with you the person of the holy spirit do you know there was something that happened very early for me in ministry that changed my life and, and it marked well many things changed my life but this marked it not changed it marked my life it was a time when I was doing a teaching series on the Holy Spirit. There are two times I've encountered Satan. That was the first time. I was doing a teaching series on the Holy Spirit. And one particular night after service, I had an encounter with Satan. And he literally tells me to stop preaching about the Holy Spirit. And I remember for me it was like, it was laughable. Because I'm like, is this how you do deals? <laughs> this is a joke. <laughs> I said, no, I'm going to continue teaching on the Holy Spirit. And then he threatens me with something. He says, if you don't stop, he tells me something that will happen. And I just I thought it was a joke. I'm like, this is foolish, right? I continued the teaching series on the Holy Spirit. And that thing happened. And I was so confused. I said, wait, hold up. So I go to the Lord, and I'm like... God, what did I miss? How, how is it that the enemy could orchestrate this against me and it happened? And the Lord began to show me. He said, he was showing me how one of the things that the enemy is most threatened by is a believer who knows the power of the Holy Spirit in them. And he said, there's certain, and, and, and to unpack this would be a, on another time. But he said, there are certain things that before you teach on it, you have to consecrate yourself. You have to be in prayer because the teaching is warfare. You don't just wake up and, you know, because I told you this is what I want you to teach on, you don't treat it randomly because what you're doing is starting. You see, warfare is not always what the enemy starts. Oftentimes, it's what you started. You just don't know that you started the warfare. He said what you were teaching, you did not come in a place of prayer before you started teaching it and you exposed yourself. So the Lord gives me, he says, now go on a 40 day fast and prayer. So for 40 days I was fasting and praying. On the 40th day, the thing that happened reversed. I'm sharing this with you 
Because there is power when you come to understand the person of the Holy Spirit. He is, he, he is the power behind everything that you would do. He is, he is wisdom. He is counsel. He, I mean, he, he searches the mind of the Father and reveals it to you. He is God in you. So back to the question, what have you done with the Holy Spirit? You're not limited, but you limit him. You're not limited in life. You literally have the greatest advantage, and that is God in you. And when you begin to see him as a person, not a force, but a person that is grieved, when your life is going in a direction that is not pleasing to God, then love is the motivator. It's not about, oh my gosh, I don't want to disobey out of fear. No, I love him. That's why he's also called a friend. I don't want to hurt my friend, especially when it's a friend whose best intentions are for me, who knows me in truth, who knows the way I should take. And the Holy Spirit wants to lead you to take territory. He wants to speak to you. He wants to give you precision about your life. But here's the thing, and I don't want you to miss this, right? Don't hear this and think that you being more open to receiving the Holy Spirit is only on the, the, the weight of, God, give me that business idea. God, make me influential in arts and media. Holy Spirit, I'm all yours. Talk to me. Because there are the gifts of the Spirit, right? Faith, healings, miracles, word of knowledge, wisdom, things that would radically put you in positions of leadership, right? Because when, when you have faith that comes from the Holy Spirit, is the faith of God. You, you, you become bold about things that should not make any sense. Why are you bold about doing this, right? When you receive wisdom from the Holy Spirit, you have this divine intelligence about what you should do. When you receive a word of knowledge, you begin to know things you have no business knowing. It puts you in positions of leadership. But that's not where he stops or starts. He starts with the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, patience. Too many times we are after the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, but we don't want to submit to be cultivated and to be pruned that our lives will reveal the fruits. Do you know that the Lord does not say you will know them by their manifestations? He says you will know my people by the fruits. So before the Holy Spirit puts you in a position where you are moving in word of knowledge, moving in wisdom, that comes from him, not another false spirit, right? You are moving in the things that comes from God. He first works on the person. So if you feel like you're not hearing from God concerning your business, concerning the industry he placed you in, why don't you do a fruit check? When the Lord told me to forgive that person, did I forgive? When the Holy Spirit told me to, to call this person and apologize, was I so caught up in my ego that I said no? For those that are married in the, in the house, for the men, are you loving your wives the way Christ loved the church? Whether she's difficult or not, that's why he gave a standard as Christ loved the church. The church, whether they rejected him or whatever, as Christ, love the church. The men as the, house, as the head of the household, it's not a title just to, you know, you know walk around, sashay around the place, you know? No. <laughs> it's a title to say you should embody and reflect the love of God to your wife. That when she sees you, it brings her closer to seeing me. As women, the Holy Spirit is in there when you don't submit to your husband's culture has made that a, a term of oppression. It's not. 
A woman's power is not in her fighting tug of war with her husband. It's in her submission. And you have to know this, that God, when a woman submits, when a man loves the wife, it carries the fragrance of the blessings of God. Because when a man, the Bible literally says, if a man mistreats his wife, he should not even pray. Can you imagine? It says that the ears of God will be shut to him. So if he's mistreating her, you know who he doesn't sense close? The Holy Spirit. And if a wife is not submissive to her husband, because it says, it also gave women a standard, it says, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. You don't always agree with what the Lord tells you to do. You don't always see eye to eye with the Lord. Why? Because he says the man, as a, the husband, is now your covering. It says that for every wife, the husband is the head, and for every husband, Christ is the head. There is an order in God, and why is this? It's not to oppress you. I'm saying this for both married and single people who want to be married, because marriage, and we're going on a, on a tangent here, but you need to hear this because it's connected to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> marriage, marriage is the only institution that reveals the mystery of oneness. The Trinity are three, but they are one. The same way it says the man and the woman would become one. It is a mystery of God that he reveals through marriage. And, what it, and, and do you know this? Jesus, when he was on earth, you know whose will he lived to do? The Father. The Holy Spirit, do you know whose will he seeks to glorify? Jesus. None of them are after their own interest. That is how they function as one. Jesus had a will, but his will was to do the will of the Father. The Holy Spirit has a will, but his will is to do the will of Jesus. His will is to glorify Jesus, not himself. That is why the Holy Spirit and the wife have the same name, helper. But culture would mess you up to think that this is about, you know, how I came is how you met me is how I'm staying. No, how are you become one if you're trying to be two? There are things that have to shed. And why is that? Because marriage will prune you in a way that you need the dependency of God to remove all that ego. God is after image. He wants you to look like what he formed. So women don't submit to their husbands because they agree, no. They submit because that's the order of God. And even when it looks like this man's wisdom is not, you know, wisdom in. <laughs> you know who you take it up with? The one he is submitted to. You say, all right, God. Now you got to step in on this one. There is a blessing in order. There is a blessing in the order of God. That's why he's not going to allow the woman to, you see, God cares about, the, the woman is so powerful. That is why the Lord says for her to submit. The Holy Spirit was the power behind the ministry of Jesus on the earth. But he, it had to be within the will of the Father. Because a woman's power <laughs> that's a whole different message we got to go <laughs> but here's the thing why I'm sharing this is that women have to realize God is not trying to oppress you and because he loves you so much that is why he tells the man if you oppress her don't even talk to me because in all her vulnerability I put her under your care that's what submission is. Submission. God says in all her power, I told her to submit to you. So she's vulnerable because she is submitted. Yeah. 
So in her vulnerability, if you oppress her, I will not even hear your prayers. Business starts to trip out. Things are not working out in your life and you think your wife is a problem? No, your submission to the Lord about how you treat her is the problem. And for women, if you start trying to be the head of the household, you are the problem. And it's not in order. So the things, so you start, you also start feeling far from the Holy Spirit and you're wondering, why do I feel far from him? Because he's after image. You can't be asking him about the business and your home is in chaos. Where is the fruit? You got to know this because this culture would lie to you. You can be a feminist all you want in the world, in, in, in the marketplace, but when you come home, stop doing this tug of war. You need to know this because the Holy Spirit is after your fruit. And when you are open to cultivating fruit with him, now he begins to manifest through you. That's why the gifts of the Holy Spirit are also known as the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. God does not identify you when you start manifesting the nature of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't, ident he doesn't identify you when you start speaking in tongues and prophesying because he says, no, that is already the outcome of fruit. So he's not looking for that. He's looking for fruit because that could be mimicked <laughs> without fruit. That could be gotten from other channels outside of the Holy Spirit. So God is looking for fruit. I'm just telling you this because if you, are, if you feel like you are struggling to hear the voice of God, check the fruit. Because I'll tell you something and we're going to close. When Abraham, when God met Abraham and told him about the, his promises for Abraham, Abraham was very old in age. Sarah, very old in age, right? She didn't think she could have children anymore. But when God met him, he tells him, you will have a son. And when God is speaking, then how it's manifested is without compromise, right? Because it's God speaking. Tells him you would have a son. They have this whole moment. They have a covenant. Beautiful moment. After that, Sarah comes to Abraham. And this is why the moment we had earlier is so important. Because sometimes you think your thoughts are your own. No. They came from somewhere else. Because this whole time, Sarah did not have no witty ideas. All of a sudden, she says, you know, babe. Menopause has come and gone, right? For women, you know what that means. Men, you have a mother. You'll be all right. <laughs> she said, Sarah, I mean, Abraham, you know, I'm way too old. So why don't you just sleep with one of my servants and let me have a child through her? The timing is questionable. There's some things you're thinking it's you, but you just came in agreement with to say it's you. It's not, it didn't start with you. These were planted thoughts. So Sarah goes to Abraham, tells him all of that, and the Bible highlights, it says, and Abraham listened to the voice of his wife, Sarah. So he sleeps with a woman, they have a child, Ishmael. But you know for about 11, is it 11 years, Pastor Eb? About 11 years, God went silent. From that moment, God went silent. There was no word to Abraham after that. And when he shows up again, the first thing he says is be blameless before me. What was God after? Fruit. He said, Abraham, be patient. Trust me. You've been patient all this time. Fruit is a, a patience is a fruit of the spirit. You've been patient all this time. When I give you a word, we have a covenant, we do the whole thing. You follow another voice and not mine. I'm after fruit. And maybe I needed to take 11 years of silence because the silence was a seed. 
so that I can cultivate more fruit. You see, sometimes God's silence is not punishment, but it is a seed that you would recognize the weight of relationship with him and the weight of his words to you. You may feel like you're struggling to hear God and, and this is what you've said. I've fasted, I've prayed, I've done all the things that people are saying. I've been praying, praying, praying. I've been fasting, fasting, fasting. But here's the answer. You cannot trap God in a formula. Spiritual disciplines help. They create a space for God. But you cannot trap God in spiritual disciplines. Because how he deals with each and every one of us is unique. You might be fasting, praying, doing all the things, but the fruit is the problem. Maybe the voice of God is silent because the last thing he said to you about forgiveness is still a stumbling block. You're not willing to let that one go. And here is what you do. We are out of time. When God gives you a word, it's not like this robotic command, right? It's not for you to feel like, but God, this person did this to me. I don't know how to forgive them. God is not trying to have you be a robot. But it is an invitation to search his word and to seek him on his revelation on how that will be possible in your life. It's not for you to shut the door immediately and say, God, that, 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 ooh, <laughs> bruh, it's not going to happen. But it's an invitation. He says, look, I'm not trying to have you be a robot. I know what happened to you. It hurt. It's, it was not, was not nice. But open your heart and I will teach you how forgiveness becomes possible. And through that forgiveness, the floodgates begin to open. God's wisdom is unlocked in your life. The word of knowledge is unlocked in your life. Prophecy is unlocked in your life. Faith is unlocked in your life. And everyone is different. And what I want to challenge you is to study about the fruits of the Holy Spirit. And do a fruit check. Maybe the area that God is working on me is patience. Maybe because I, I, I'm still like uh, this area, I have not really honed in on it. And it's not, it's out of love. Because remember, God is the one sending you. And he wants to send his representative. He's not trying to send a zombie. He wants to send someone that embodies his nature. And so however long it takes, that's all right. He will continue to do that work. And when you're ready... What could take seven years, he could do in seven months. So don't even be worried about the time. Don't put pressure on yourself to, to get it immediately. Because when you're ready, when you are tuned into the frequency of God's voice, he would redeem the years. There are areas in my life, I'll be honest with you, this is me too. There are areas of my life that God has revealed to me. I've called you to walk in, in this. But before you can walk in, in it, before I open the door, we got to work on this fruit right here. We got to work on this right here. And when we work on this fully, this door will open up to you. I'm not in a hurry, but I'm submitted. And that's what God is calling you to do to be submitted. Stand with me, family. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We're going to pray. Um, and just after we pray, you know, normally we, you know, after worship, we would have announcements and offering and all of that. But just in the flow of the Holy Spirit, we switch things up a bit. Um, but at the close of service, you know, the, we'll have like the offering buckets and everything at the door. And I just want to say that because even as we are in this series, God has need of how we steward our finances and our resources and how we support even what the mountain of religion is doing through the church, right? And so when you're giving, though, I know they'll have the stuff on the screen, but we'll have the, 
the people right at the doors as well. But I want us to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you know that today you are recommitting yourself, you realize a couple things. For some of you, your repentance has been on the schedule. For some of you, you didn't realize why you were in the industry you were in. You just thought it was about a check. You just thought it was about, you know, fun time, good life, and all that stuff. But you were sent to do business, to occupy. Life doesn't end on earth. It doesn't end here. There are things that we will be held accountable when we transition to heaven. The Holy Spirit wants to walk with you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to be your friend. God in you. And if you want to recommit how you walk with him, I want you to just come to this altar right now. And we're going to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You want to recommit yourself to say, God, I've, I've been treating you more with a fear mentality than from a place of love. And I want to be sent by you. It's nothing for you to be afraid of. It's nothing that comes with shame. It's just truth. God loves you. And he wants to walk with you. And if you understand this about the Holy Spirit, that he is a friend, he is a helper, it will change your life. So come down to the altar. Let the shame go. I hear that so clearly. Take it off. Stop putting on the things that have kept you bound. It's not you. It's not you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We got to go, but I see this. There are some people the Lord is after. And the reason I'm calling you to come down is shame has crippled you so much. And you don't believe that you are worthy to walk with the Holy Spirit. You don't believe that you are worthy to walk with the understanding of God in me. That when I met Jesus, I received the Holy Spirit, but not just as a, as a thing that I say, but it's the reality. God in me. Do you know when, when Satan was after Peter and set up people so that Peter could deny Christ? Why did he want Peter to deny Christ? Especially when Jesus is like, he's telling the Lord. And you know, Jesus prays for Peter that his faith will not fail him. But could it be that he wanted um, Peter to deny Christ because maybe that's the way he traps him in shame? That Peter, if you denied Christ, then how would you feel bold enough to tell people to accept him? Because what Satan was more worried about was the fact that it was not that version of Peter he, that was a threat to him, no. He was threatened by the version of Peter who would be walking with the Holy Spirit. So he says, how can, how, how can I corrupt his mind that he would not know what he has in the Holy Spirit? How can I get him to be so focused on his mistakes that he does not have the boldness to feel worthy of God in him. So he does a setup. But Peter didn't fall for it. And I'm believing, I'm looking at a room full of people who are not going to fall for it either. So there are some of you, the Lord will not let this go. If you know I'm speaking to you, come down. 
And Lord, I pray you just put a, a burning, a, a burning feeling on their chest right now so you know God is after you. Thank you, Lord. 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 Now we can pray. Thank you, Jesus. 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 If you're giving your life to Jesus today, you walked in here maybe for good vibes and community, but something is tugging at your heart and you want to commit your life to Jesus, you cannot have the Holy Spirit without saying yes to the Lord. If that is you, I just want you to wave right now. Amen. Amen. We see you. Amen. Amen. Can we glorify God in this place? Amen. Amen. Family, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we worship you. We thank you, Lord, for your sons and daughters. And Lord, even now you're showing me a young lady, and this could speak to some mothers, but a young lady, you, your hair is colored. You dyed your hair. And you felt as though if you walked down the aisle, the eyes of people looking at you, it, it felt like it would be too loud. It would be too loud. It would be too loud that you're still struggling. God has given you visions and dreams about who he has called you to be. But there is this deep struggle of unworthiness because you're still seeing yourself from all the things you have done. And the Lord is showing me this now because he is saying to you, he said, even when you feel like you can't, I will carry you. It's not, God, God wants to radically love you. The Bible says God is love. His love would inspire change out of you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Brenda, I want you to go hug this lady right here with blue hair. Thank you, Lord. See, there's some times where you feel like life has overwhelmed you so much that you're like, God, I can't. And he says, you're right, because it would not be in your strength, but it would be in his strength. There are times where you feel, literally, it's like a weight is holding you back. But in your surrender, the Lord says, I will carry you to it. And I pray that as Pastor Brenda is holding you, that you will know it is but a glimpse of the love of God. It doesn't even scratch the surface, but God is after you. And he would radically love you in ways. There are things that would be drawn to you. There are things that you don't want to go after. And the Lord says, you know what? I'm going to bring it to you. And I rebuke imposter syndrome in the name of Jesus. You will know that God has called and qualified you for what he assigned to you. And if you're receiving that, just lift up your hands right now. Heavenly Father, we love you. Who is like you, Lord Jesus? No one. Your love is what transforms us from the inside out. And I thank you, Lord, that your sons and daughters would know that you are never about keeping anything from them, but that you want to work something in them, that they would begin to be like you, 
that they would be transformed to your image and bear the fruits that speak of you and then that is how you equip them you equip them by their fruits and then you send them into the marketplace and so I thank you Lord that they would move in boldness they would move in confidence they would move knowing that heaven is backing them up as they submit to you have your way Holy Ghost move in the lives of your sons and daughters and Lord let it be our testimony that you and us will change this world for the kingdom of God to be manifested and I thank you for those that said yes to you let us all say this together as a family for those who are saying yes to the Lord Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. Thank, you. thank you I confess with my mouth that you are my Lord and Savior on the cross my sins were put to death and when you were raised up free and victorious I was raised up with you now Holy Spirit make my life your home in Jesus name amen amen family we love you can we glorify Jesus in this place hallelujah I want to speak a blessing over you may the Lord God bless and keep you May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance over you all and grant you shalom, shalom. And that is perfect peace. We love you, family. God bless you.